and ask him. <laughs> Very good. Hey, <clears throat> okay. Deluxion, of course, uh, you know, is a, a, a Torontonian, I'm sure, as most of you know, and has spent many, many years teaching in Toronto at York University. And uh, so he's always, you know, interested in what's going on in our, our community back here. And it's been a while. So uh, Dr. Luxon played a major role in our community and taught men, many of the teachers in our day school system went through the program at York University, which I think is the only one in North America to train teachers in an academic setting at York University to be- At least one of them is uh, watching us uh, right now. Okay, I'm happy to hear that. So Dr. Luxon's very invested in the education system, even though he's in Israel in, in Toronto, and it's a pleasure to welcome him back. We uh, had him teaching him in the, in the spring, and he taught one of our Tanakh classes, and really it's uh, a pleasure to introduce this series and hopefully more series as uh, I believe he said his son-in-law came up with the the title, um, the Biblical Commentaries They Didn't Teach You in Yeshiva. So with that little Hello. bit of an introduction, Dr. Luxon, uh, a warm welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful to see you. They, I keep seeing faces that I want to uh, say hello to, but I, I, I better not start because that would take the, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire hour. But it's very wonderful to see uh, so, many, uh, so many friends, uh, former students, colleagues, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I gave a series of, of talks about the classical biblical uh, commentaries, as, uh, as Rabbi Kelman just said, uh, a number of months ago. And it's amazing the lasting power of those commentaries, how Rashi, Rashbam, Ibn Ezra, and Ramban, they're still like uh, the commentaries, Rashi in particular. But when, when a Jew sits down, uh, to to study the parsha, you know th those are the uh, commentaries that are taken uh, that, that are taken out. That, that <laughs> we'd require a whole uh, lecture, I think, about how that came to be. But I, 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 all I want to point out today is how strange that is, because those commentaries, while they're dealing, all commentaries, of course, deal with the biblical text, but. That those commentaries are also dealing with the problems of the medieval world, with the problems of Aristotelian philosophy, with the problems of the Karaite threat. The uh, the Karaites, a group of Jews who didn't accept uh, uh, rabbinic uh, rabbinic authority. These these were the burning issues. The uh, hello uh, the danger of hello. An of anti uh, Jewish polemics coming from Christian circles. Uh, the, 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 these were at the center of the concerns of the, uh, of the authors back in those uh, days. And those are not the major problems that we are facing right now. We're gonna start, look, in this uh, course, we're gonna look at some early modern commentators. We're not dealing with 20th century commentators yet, but we're looking at early modern commentators from the, uh, fr from the 18th century, the 19th century, and the first few years of the 20th century. We haven't, we're not going to get to, uh, to contemporary uh, uh, commentaries. And they are dealing with a lot of issues that are uh, real issues still today for, uh, for Jews in the 21st century who are studying the Bible, as we will see very soon when we uh, start uh, looking at some texts from Samuel David Lutzato, Shmuel David Lutzato, known as Shadal. I hope Rabbi Kelman, you've given me the uh, possibility of sharing a screen. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, I need to be able to share a screen, uh, Rabbi Kelman. Yeah, I'm sorry, you, you, you can, you can. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to do it right away. My Very apologies. good, but great. It's Thank you. Okay, here we are. Bible commentaries they didn't teach me in yeshiva. Shatal. Uh, Samuel David Lusato, born in uh, Trieste in Italy in 1800 and died in 1865. Uh, he had a very difficult life. Shatal's mother died when he was 14 years old. Uh, he tried to learn a living to try to help the, uh, the family support themselves. He tried watchmaking and he even tried making spaghetti as a, uh, as a way of uh, making a living, but that didn't work out very well. He dropped out of school and he uh, 
around the time that his mother uh, that his mother died, and he was like self-taught and taught by his father. Uh, after that, he was an extremely well-educated uh, person and a, a true autodidact who, who taught himself uh, dozens of languages, or maybe not dozens of languages, many languages: uh, read Latin, Greek, German, French. I don't know if he knew English, which was not that important in the beginning of the 19th century in Jewish studies circles to know English, but he also taught himself uh, other Semitic languages that were just beginning to, to, to be studied in, the, in those days. So he, despite leaving school, he became an extremely uh, well-educated person. Later on in life, his wife died when she was very young. Two of his children died in their youth. It just seems like a, a, a story of tragedy. Um, he started writing poetry in Hebrew and in Italian when he was eight years old. He'd gone through Shas, did Siuma Shas twice before he was 18 years old. Uh, he was writing books by the time that he was 18 years old. And for all of his life, pretty well for all of his adult life, he taught at the Modern Orthodox Rabbinical Seminary in Padua. Uh, and that's where he established his, uh, uh, his reputation. He was definitely considered orthodox in Italy in those days, but I guess a question that we will keep in the back of our mind as we look at his commentaries is, uh, was he orthodox according to today's standards? Uh, I'll, share you, uh, I'll share with you a story from uh, almost 50 years ago when I was a student in Yeshivat Merkaz Arav Kuk uh, here, in, here in Jerusalem. And I was sitting in the Beit Midrash one day and I was reading a book that was published by, uh, by Yeshiva University called uh, Samuel David Lutzato's uh, Ethical Psychological uh, Theory of, uh, of Judaism. And one of the older Yeshiva boys uh, came up to me and he said, uh, what's this book about? So I told him it's about Shadal. And he said, I don't know that it's permissible to read Shadal in the Yeshiva. Uh, and I said, really? And so, you know, I was, I was young, I think I was like 19 years old. And so I decided, you know, I'd go and I'd ask the Rosh Yeshiva. So I, uh, I went after Shachrit one morning and I went and I asked uh, uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, the Rosh Yeshiva, if it was permissible for me to read uh, Shadal. Uh, I think my, uh, my feeling was that if it wasn't, I, I wanted to beat a hasty uh, exit from the Yeshiva. Uh, and, and so Rav Tzvi Huda started to explain to me the things that he disagreed with Shadal about. And I said, and after he explained some of the things that he disagreed with Shadal about, I said, is it permissible to read what he writes? And he said, yes, it's permissible to read what he writes. So I felt, I felt better that I got a hechsher from uh, Rav Tzvi Huda. I could tell that older boy in the yeshiva that the Rosh Yeshiva allowed me to read, the, uh, to read Shadal. But certainly nobody there was teaching Shadal. It wasn't, uh, even though, as we will see today, Shadal deals with a lot of issues that are relevant issues for, uh, that was 20th century, and now for 21st century people who are looking at the Bible. Uh, Shadal was definitely part of the religious enlightenment. He was involved with the uh, enlightenment circles, and in the enlightenment circles, there were the... Uh, Shomrei Mitzvot, the religious ones in these enlightenment circles and the ones who were, uh, who were not uh, Shomrei Mitzvot. Uh, he wrote 13 books in Italian and 20 books in Hebrew. Um, I've always really wanted to write about Shadal because I, I just love his commentary. I love the things that I've, uh, th th that I've read, but I, I feel guilty writing about him because I don't read Italian. And who knows what he says in those, uh, in those 13 uh, books in, uh, in Italian. Uh, one book that he wrote in Italian was a four volume autobiography in which the first volume I was told uh, involves his life up to age 14, and which was when his mother died, as we mentioned before. Uh, you know, I try to think to myself, if I ever decided to write an autobiography, that, which I, I, I don't think I would ever think about that, 
but if I decided to write an autobiography, what did I have to say about my life before the age of 14 that would fill up a volume that somebody might want to read? I, you know, I don't know if I could come up with a paragraph of something that people would want to be reading, but Chantal had a more interesting life than I did. And uh, apparently, I, I, I didn't read this, but I was told that what it says in this, one of the things that he discusses is his mother's illness and the fact that the family was urging Chatal to pray for his mother using various Kabbalistic prayers, including, you know, reciting the same verse many times or various words in Hebrew that aren't really words in Hebrew, but that are uh, based on various Kabbalistic uh, uh, secrets. And, and Chatal refused to do this. And he said that people used to think that he didn't love his mother who was dying. And that's why he was refusing to say these prayers. But it wasn't true. He said when she was in her last time, then she was uh, throwing up and, and, and she, she wasn't, people were staying away from sitting with her. And I sat with her and I, I because I, I, I loved my mother, but I just couldn't bring myself to say these prayers that I didn't uh, believe in. He was he had very wide interest. He was extremely interested in grammar. He was extremely interested in poetry. He was extremely interested in liturgy. He writes strongly against the reform movement. And we will see some of the things that he says about, uh, about reform Judaism. But critics of his say that some aspects of the reform way of looking things also influenced him. I'll let everybody make, uh, make their own decisions when we look at the text about whether that's uh, a, a correct thing to say that the, the reformist kind of spirit of the time influenced him. He wrote strongly against the documentary hypothesis, which was just starting up in the, uh, at that point during his life in the first part of the 19th century was like the, uh, the, the time when the theories of the documentary hypothesis were being, uh, were being put together and we'll see, a, we'll see Chadal dealing with that today. As I said before, he was, uh, he was against uh, Kabbalah. Uh, I'm just gonna stop myself for a second to say, I'm, I, I see that uh, chat things are coming in. I'm not gonna be looking at them during the talk. I'm gonna stop five or 10 minutes before the end of the uh, hour and look at them uh, then. Uh, so if you've asked some question right now, I'm sorry. Uh, if you see something, Rabbi Kelman, that needs uh, clarification, uh, you, you feel free to interrupt me. Uh, he was strongly anti-Kabbalah, which is not something that you find often in, uh, in Orthodox circles. That uh, there are people in Orthodox circles who say, I don't have anything to do with Kabbalah. And I think I've quoted uh, to these uh, people here the line that I heard from uh, Nahama Leibovich uh, many years ago when I was her student that she said, when she's reading Ramban's commentary on the Torah, and she comes to the words, emet. here's the Kabbalistic meaning. She said, I, you know, I, I just stop reading because I, I don't understand that. And, and, and so you, you often hear a line like that in. Orthodox circles of people saying, I don't know any, uh, anything about Kabbalah, but it, it wasn't that Shadal was saying he doesn't know anything about Kabbalah, but he thought that Kabbalah was, uh, was a distortion of Judaism. And he also was one of the first people who argued strongly that the Zohar could not have been written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And curiously, this fits in with his fascination with Ta'amei HaMikra, uh, that the, uh, the, the his, with the cantillation signs on the Torah portion, uh, he, he wrote a little pamphlet that explained how the Zohar could not have been written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai because the Zohar refers to the shapes of various Ta'ame HaMikra. Uh, in fact, like the, uh, the, the the sign that is known as the Zarka, which looks like a snake in the, uh, in the Zohar, there's a reference. The, this word has a Zarka on it and it's because it's connected to a snake. And so that's, uh, and it has this certain meaning to it. And Shadal notes that the Zarka used in the earliest years didn't look like a snake 
But by the time of the Middle Ages, it started to look like a snake. And this proves that the, uh, the Zohar could not have been written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai back in the uh, second century. So volum it was a voluminous correspondence. Aside from all those, those 33 books at the top, there are volumes of, thick volumes of Igrot Shadal, and mostly in Hebrew, uh, to people all over the world uh, with whom he had uh, a, a correspondence. Historic commentary was published in Hebrew posthumously based on the notes that his students took in his classes. He published a Torah commentary in Italian while he was alive, but the commentary that we'll be looking at now is the posthumous Hebrew commentary on the Torah put together by his students after he died. Just uh, before we start looking at, uh, at, at his commentary on the Torah, I thought I'd just share with you a, uh, a little thing, a little look at uh, Shadal's personality. One time, Shadal got a letter from Rabbi Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, and it was written in German. And Shadal had no problem reading German. That was one of the many languages that he was uh, fluent in. But he wrote this little ditty when uh, he got this uh, letter from Hirsch in Hebrew. He writes, Mahayalo le Baal Igrot Zafon. What happened? To the author of Igrot Zafon, that's uh, Rav Shem Shem Rafael Hirsch, Hanefachliot Geiger or Holdheim? Does he think that he's like uh, Rabbi Geiger or Rabbi Holdheim, the reform rabbis? He ichdov le Shadal belashon hatzafon. He's writing to Shadal in in that the language of that northern country of Germany. Velo bisvat Yehuda v'Yerushalayim, and not in and not in Hebrew. I love rhyming of Holdheim with Yerushalayim. Uh, so he, he was a Hebrew purist. He loved uh, he loved Hebrew. We'll, we'll see a little bit more about that. As I was preparing this class, I thought to myself, gee, it might be nice if I could find a text from uh, Parshat Noach that uh, that would exemplify. Uh, Shadal's uh, method as a Torah commentator. And I, uh, I opened up Shadal on Parshat Noach and almost this entire class will be texts of Shadal from Parshat Noach because it's just, it's just filled with things that I think make you understand who Shadal is. In his uh, almost opening comment on Parshat Noach, he writes, Throughout the Noah story, we find the divine names yod hey vav hey and Elohim mixed up in such a way that totally disproves the claim of those who say that Moses found various ancient scrolls and combine them into one document. Uh, of course, he knows well that the critics don't say that, that it was Moses who combined it, but they, they say that it was a, a later editor who combined it, but he's just using a line that appears in the Midrash that does say that the, in Moshe's composition of Sefer Breshit, there's a line in the Midrash that says, that one opinion says, Megilot, Megilot, Matzah, that, that Moshe found Megilot and he used them to, uh, to write Sefer, uh, Sefer Bereshit. Um, parshiot asher bahem shem Elohut nichtavu b'dor echad v'yadei arashim miyuchadim v'asher bahem shem havaya nichtavu b'dor acher v'yadei anashim acherim. That the sections using the name Elohim were written in one generation by a specific people, and the ones using the name Yudhe Vavhe were written by other people in a different generation. And Shadal says, Contemporary scholars have expended much energy on these studies and have come up with nothing. And, 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 and so he's arguing that the essence of the documentary hypothesis makes no sense. And the, the only thing that comes close to actually being a, uh, a lot of this is rhetoric here, but the argument that he's saying, when you look at the Noah story and you see 
that the divine names yud heh vav -Hey, and Elohim are mixed together. There's going back and forth between those uh, sources. That proves that it couldn't have been from multiple sources. This is because I think in the earliest years of the documentary hypothesis, there, there wasn't what I call the scissors and tape kind of approach. There was the claim, okay, here's a story that's written by J, and here's a story that's written by E. Here's a, stor uh, here's a story that uses the name yud heh vav -Hey, and here's a story that uses the name Elohim, and those are two different, uh, two different authors. Shadal looks at the Noah story and sees the constant back and forth between yud heh vav -Hey and Elohim and says, this disproves what, what now, later on critics started to say that the redactor who put together the final documents that uh, later critics were saying used scissors and tape and cut things up from these two documents that were sitting in front of him and, and, and came, up, uh, came up with the text. So it's funny that Shadal says that Shadal feels that the Noah story is proof against the documentary hypothesis. And these days, when people write books or write articles trying to prove the documentary hypothesis, they often cite the Noah story as their proof of the documentary hypothesis. Uh, it's because now the proponents of the documentary hypothesis, as I said before, they're willing to say that the editor cut and paste, pasted and put documents together. And so, for example, I found on the, uh, I found on the web uh, this division of the Noah story into the sources made you know, clear for you to be able to see how the editor, this is somebody who believes in the documentary hypothesis, and who says that the editor has, okay, the, uh, the blue is the, according to this uh, guy who wrote this, blue is the document E and red is the document P. And so, and that in the middle of verse two, the editor just decided that he had to throw in uh, four words in Hebrew from, uh, from P in the middle of a section that was from E. And then between verse five and seven of chapter eight, uh, the, the editor decided that he had to go back to the P document and throw in a verse there that couldn't be part of E. Some of, I don't know, maybe there are some people here who are impressed with this and find this, uh, uh, find this to be a, uh, an insightful way of looking at the biblical text. I look at, uh, at, at uh, attempts like this, and Shadal looks at attempts like this and says, you know, this text proves that, you know, they go back and forth between, uh, between the, the name yud heh vav -Hey and the name Elohim all the time. And so, so, so that's not a sign of multiple sources. So here we see right away in the beginning of Parshat Noach, um, Shadal arguing that the documentary hypothesis makes no sense. We go on in his commentary and we will see a text of his, this is, I consider, this is also from Parshat Noach. And I, I consider this one of the most, one of the strangest proofs that Moshe must have been the author of the Torah. Uh, he, he knew that people were saying in his days that the Torah was written after the days of Moshe. And so here in his commentary on Parshat Noah, he offers an argument about why we should say that Moshe is the author of the Torah, or at least in this section that we're going to look at, he's arguing that the Torah must go back uh, before the year, let's say, 1000 BCE, that it couldn't be. The critics were saying are the dating documents like J and E and P to the uh, uh, 8th century to the 7th century. And Shadal is saying, no, the, the, uh, we see from this verse that the Torah must have been written before the year 1000. Based on the verse that says that when Noah got out of the ark, and he offered a sacrifice to God. It says, Vayara Hashem The Lord smelled the pleasing odor of the sacrifice. 
Chadal begins by quoting a Dutch theologian from the 17th century. It just, it, he read just so widely. Uh, this Dutch theologian wrote that Hanichoach, Mishorash Nuach, Minyan Bahanichoti Hamati Baha, Vesara Kinati Mimcha, Korban He Asui Le Shakech Hamat Ha'il. The Lord smelled the pleasing odor. Nichoach comes from the root nun vav chet, as in the phrase, when I have satisfied my fury upon you and my rage has departed from you, then I will be tranquil, I will be angry no more. In other words, it means a sacrifice that calms God's anger. That, of course, we're all uncomfortable when we read these words, as is Shadal, when he writes these words, that that's what Rea Hanichoach means. It's a smell that will calm God down, that will calm down God's anger. And then he writes, a phrase of this nature has to be understood according to the principle, the Torah speaks in the language of human beings. In other words, according to the level of human understanding in the generation when the prophet lived, when the author of the text lived, he authors in texts, of course, are always considering, if I, when I wrote a book, I wasn't thinking to myself, uh, what are people going to think about this book in 500 years? Because I, I don't know anything about what the world's going to be like in 500 years. I, uh, when I think about my audience, I think about people who are alive right now. And, then, and so when the author wrote here, Vayara Hashem Edreya Hanichoach, the author was thinking about the level of the readers the theological level of the readers in his day. Shadal goes on. Vechan ra'uy lehit bonin. Ki Shmuel hanavi amar le Shaul, hachefetz l'ashem bo olot uzvachim, ki Shmoa b'kol Hashem ine Shmoa mizevach tov. Umisham va'elach matzano ha'yidiya hazot mefursemet b'Yisrael. David Amar, Kilotachpot Zevach, I should say Zevach with a head, sorry about that. Im Erav lo Omar lacha, Olava Chata'a lo Sha'alta, Vechol Hanavim Asher Bimei Hamelachim, Kulam Hirchivu Pe Alze. Samuel the prophet said to Saul, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to the Lord's command? Surely obedience is better than sacrifice. And from that time onwards, this idea was the Jewish idea. We find that this understanding was widespread among the Israelites. For example, King David said in Tehillim, you do not want me to bring sacrifices. You, God, do not desire burnt offerings. And were I, God, hungry, I would not tell you. And you do not ask for burnt offerings and sin offerings. So in other words, by the time we get to David HaMelech, by the time we get to Shmuel HaNavi, everybody understood that God does not need sacrifices and that the sacrifices don't do anything for God. All the prophets in the days of the kings promulgated this idea, says Shadal. So if we find here, Bayara Hashem what must we conclude? Meata, hine hadavar barur kashemesh, kilo yitachin, she yes, sefer ha Torah, nichtav be meha blachim, o mishmuel ulamata, ki a Torah divra kilshon. Okay. Accordingly, it is as clear as day that the Pentateuch could not have been written in the days of the kings or at any time after the days of Samuel, because by those days people realized that God didn't need korbanot. Ki ha Torah divra kilshon bene adam asher sichlam omed be matzav shafel maod mi matzav Yisrael be meha malachim. For the Torah spoke in the idiom of people whose minds were at a much lower level than the minds of the Israelites in the days of the kings. In other words, uh, this, if you'll pardon me for saying this primitive kind of idea that. God smells the odor of the sacrifice and that, uh, that, that, that gets rid of God's uh, anger. It causes, uh, it calms God's anger. Uh, any author after the year 1000 BCE would not have been writing this to a Jewish audience because the Jewish audience had already advanced 
past the low level that they were in at the time that the Torah was given, that at the time that the Torah was given, people still had primitive ideas about God. And therefore, the Torah is addressing them in the language that they understand. And the language that they understand is that God uh, ceased to be angry after he smelled the pleasant odor of that sacrifice. So this is this is a defense of the traditional understanding of when the Torah was written, the traditional orthodox understanding of when the Torah was written. But I don't know if any of you are members of an orthodox shul and they ask you if, if, if your shul is meeting and they ask you to give a Dvar Torah uh, on Parshat Noach. Uh, I, I'm not sure you want to say this in, in, uh, in every orthodox shul. Maybe the orthodox shul that you go to is a liberal orthodox shul and you could say this, but to say that the, the Jews in the time of, uh, uh, of the giving of the Torah at Har Sinai were at this extremely low level, but, you know, often in Jewish uh, uh, theological circles, people talk about Yeridat HaTorot, how the, the people in those days were at the, you know, such a high level and we're far from Har Sinai. So, so, uh, so, so we, we are at a lower level. No, he says, Shadal, like a good enlightenment thinker really feels that the world is progressing and the people are learning things. And that the same thing happened in the Jewish people that they were, they were learning uh, to have more sophisticated understandings about God. Okay, so these are a couple of, these were two examples of uh, Shadal taking a traditionalist kind of approach, attacking the documentary hypothesis and attacking the idea that the Torah could have been written uh, after the year 1000 BCE as, uh, as the critics uh, uh, would, would say. Uh, but now we'll see a couple of examples of Shadal doing things that one doesn't often do in orthodox circles, and that's emending the biblical text. He almost never emends the consonants of the Torah. He emends the vowels of the Torah on occasion, and he, uh, 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 and he emends the consonants of the Nevi'im and Ketuvim on occasion. So here's an example of him emending the uh, the uh, vowels in the uh, of the Torah, the verse shalosh pe'amim b'shana yirae kol zechurcha et penei ha'adon Hashem elokei Yisrael. In the standard translation, three times in the year shall your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. Uh, that phrase. Yera et pnei adon. So the, the, if those of you who know Hebrew grammar know that yera is a nifal form. It means they shall be seen. But nifal forms usually don't take et afterwards. You, you can't have a direct object of a passive verb. Uh, and, and so and, and et is the sign of a direct object. And so Shadal says, well, actually, the original version of this text was Yir'e kol zechurcha et pnei ha'adon Hashem elokei Yisrael. Uh, again, he argues that this is a more, let's say, primitive way of expressing it, that they would go there to see God. And that in a later generation, the rabbis were uncomfortable with the idea that the text says to see God. And he says that, of course, it's only the, the Torah speaks in the language of the, uh, of the level the people were at at that time. And people were at at that time. They thought, oh, if I'm coming to the Beit HaMikdash, I'm coming to see God. And so it was changed, according to him, to Yei calls uh, to Yei Ra'e, that they are coming to be seen by God instead of coming to see uh, the Lord God of Israel. That's one uh, emendation of his. Another emendation of his uh, is from the book of Yechezkel, from a verse that uh, anybody who davened this morning uh, recited this verse, Batisaini Ruach, Baruch Kavod Hashem 
Mime como part of the Uvalation prayer. And the part that he's going to be talking about those words, Baruch Kavod Hashem Mim Komo, the last four words are not just part of uh, part of Uvalation, they're part of the Kadusha prayer, and they're uh, they're, they're given great prominence in our uh, liturgy. So if you open up the uh, New Jewish Publication Society translation of, uh, of the Tanakh, you see that the translation in the text itself um, follows the words as they are here. Then a spirit carried me away and behind me I heard a great roaring sound. You can all decide whether you like the translation roaring sound for Ra'ash Gadol. Uh, one might also, I think that if I were just translating, out of context, if I were translating Ra'ash Gadol, I'd of course translate it as a great noise, a big noise. Blessed, but okay, as we'll see, that's a little problematic to say that that's what it means. Blessed is the presence of the Lord in his place. So that's the JPS translation in the text, but then there's a footnote that offers you an alternate translation. Then a spirit carried me away, and behind me I heard a great roaring sound as the presence of the Lord rose from where it stood. How do you get from Baruch Kavod Hashem Mim Komo to as the presence of the Lord rose from where it stood? The translation offered here in the footnote by the J Jewish Publication Society and their Tanakh is based on an emendation of the verse offered by Shadal. And here is Shadal's argument for his emendation. Rabbi Kelman told me that I didn't have to translate every text as long as I read it through it and, and translate it orally. This would have been a challenge to translate uh, this uh, in a uh, written way, but I'll try to walk you through this text uh, carefully here. Kol rash gadol baruch kvod Hashem in komo. begins by quoting the verse, and he says, Kol ra'ash eno mityashev al kol shel dibur. To, to use the phrase kol ra'ash, referring to words that are said, we, we don't generally call speech Ra'ash, unless we're trying to make fun of somebody, we'd say, oh, it's a lot of noise that he's making. But if you're saying po something positive about these words, Baruch, Kavod, Hashem, Yim, Komo, you wouldn't call the Ra'ash in Hebrew. Kol Ra'ash, Eno Mi Tiyashev al Kol Shel Dibur. But what does it, but it, it, it appears in other places here in Yechezka, Ella, Al Kol Kanfei HaChayot Belechtan. We find this phrase here in Yechezkel about the angels and the cherubs that he describes in his visions in the beginning of the book of Yechezkel, he uses this phrase of ra'ash gadol to describe the noise that they make when they move. And look at the next verse of Yechezkel where he says, "Vekol kanfei ha'chayot mashikot v'isha el achota v'kol ha'ofanim le'umatam v'kol ra'ash gadol. That's the next verse in Yechezkel. It says that these holy animals uh, that he sees in the uh, vision, their wings are rubbing one against another. And the ofanim, another part of his vision, the the kol ra'ash gadol. And the result is kol ra'ash gadol. It's clear. Ki kol ha'ra'ash gadol. Who call haknafaim lo call shel dibur? So it, it's clear that when in the verse here it says vashmacha I call raash gadol, it's referring to the noise made by the angels. Umilat mim komo lefi nuschat baruch kavod Hashem mim komo. It's another problem with the verse the way it's written here. Blessed be the presence of the Lord. Mim komo. You see, the JPS fudged it a little bit here. They wrote, in his place. But that's not what the word says. It says, mim komo, which means from his place. Milad mim komo lefi nuschat baruch kvod Hashem mim komo hi kashau stuma Who can understand what the word mim komo means in, in, in that verse? Lo matzanu dugmata. We can't find any such usage of mim komo anywhere uh, in, you know, 
when we work it into our kedusha on Shabbat, after the word Baruch Kvod Hashem Mim Komo, and then we say Mim Komo Hu Yifen Berachamim, from his place he will look down with us on mercy. That works just fine. So the, the, there, the, uh, the the person who put together the kedusha took that word Mim Komo and used it in a phrase that made a lot of sense. But but Shadal says here it doesn't make any sense to say Baruch Kvod Hashem Mim Komo. Radak Peresh, Rabbi David Kibchi uh, offered the explanation. Yitvasef Kvod Hashem Kishesar Mim Komo Klomar Beitra Chakomi Beit Amigdash. Radak says what Yecheskel is saying that when God leaves the Beit Amigdash, there'll be an increase in his uh, in his uh, in his kavod. The Don Yitzchak Perash and Barbanel explained, Baruch Mulal Tamid Yek Vod Hashem, Afal Pisha Sar Mim Komo Hu Beit Hamikdash. That even though, is uh, trying to be a little more historical, the Yechezkel after the uh, after the destruction of the temple, according to Barbanel, is saying, even though God has left me His Makom, Hu Sar Mim Komo, He's no longer in the Beit Hamikdash because the Beit Hamikdash has been destroyed. Still, Baruch Kavod Hashem. That's that. That's how Abarbanel tries to solve the problem of this verse. The chama de chukim urechokim a perushim ha'ele. Do you think that those are reasonable interpretations of the verse? He had strong feelings about uh, about Bible commentaries, uh, Shadal, and he he shares them with us. He's not shy about saying when he disagrees with Radak and Abarbanel. Lefichach nireli barur kitam hamelitza hazot kitam vayarom kivod Hashem me'al hakruv. The phrase here is just like the phrase in chapter 10 of Yechezkel, where it says that the presence of the Lord rose up above the kruv. Vayaromu hakruvim, the kruvim raised themselves up. Be'omdam ya'amodu uveromam ye'romu. And that we have to read this phrase as vatisaini ruach, vayashmacharai korash gadol, berum kevod Hashem mim komo, and that's the and the JPS translation of the footnote based on Shadal is then a spirit carried me away, and behind me I heard a great roaring, roaring sound as the presence of the Lord rose from where it had been. That he's seeing, he's got this vision. The angels are moving around, things are moving around. It, this divine, uh, uh, divine mystical vision that Yechezkel is happening, and all you have to do is change the kaf. To a mem. And he goes on to justify this emendation by saying, this is in the third, the end of the third last line here. The Books of the Torah were not written, the books of the Tanakh were not written in Hebrew letters that look like the letters that are on this screen right now. They were written in, he calls it the Ketav Shomroni, because the, the Samaritans uh, still have a Sefer Torah that is written in what we call now Paleo-Hebrew, what Hebrew used to look like before the, this, this is called, the Gemara calls the, the, this shape of letters that you see on the screen in front of you, they call it Ketav Ashuri. Uh, they, 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 they call it, this is what, uh, after the Jews had contact with the Assyrians and uh, then they started using this, uh, these uh, letters according to the Gemara, but they used Paleo-Hebrew and Shadal, among many, all the things that, uh, that he learned, he learned the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet, uh, which I have learned a number of times and forgotten each time that I uh, learn it because I don't use it. I don't read Paleo Hebrew often enough to remember the uh, alphabet. But here, I just gave you here a chart of the of the Samaritan Paleo Hebrew alphabet, and here's the letter Kaf. This uh, phrase, like an upside down resh, with one squiggle on top, and here's the letter Mem, which is like an upside down resh with two squiggles on top. And Shadal says, it's really easy for a kaf and a mem to get confused with each other. 
And some copyist looking at a text that said, Verum Kevod Hashem Mim Komo, when Kevod Hashem rose from its place, either by mistake, I guess it's possible that on purpose, but it might, simply to say that by, mis, uh, by mistake, the copyist changed it to Baruch Kevod Hashem Mim Komo. I was once talking with uh, a professor who's a professor of Bible who uh, doesn't know very much at all about uh, the history of Jewish interpretation of uh, text. And I mentioned, uh, I mentioned Shadal's name and he said, oh, he's the one who came up with the brilliant emendation of Ezekiel 3.12. He, he, was, uh, he said that was the only thing that he knew about Shadal, that Shadal had figured out that uh, this verse should actually be read, Berum Kavod Hashem Im Komo. Please don't say to anybody that Marty Lakshim told you that when you say Uvalat Zion tomorrow morning, you should say Berum Kavod Hashem Im Komo. I don't say Berum Kavod Hashem Im Komo, but there is some brilliance. It's, it's a Givaldic uh, emendation. It's an amazing kind of uh, emendation of re realizing the difficulty in the text and proposing the change of merely one letter and realizing that in Paleo-Hebrew, those two letters look extremely similar to each other. Uh, Shadal is also known. Here's an example, not from... Uh, not from Parshat Noach and not from uh, Yechezkel, but uh, from uh, Sefer Shmot, where the famous verse, Vayikach Sefer Abrit Vayikra Vosnei Ha'am, Vayomru Kol Asher Diber Hashem Naase V'Nishma. If you look at the first English translation at the bottom, which is the common Jewish understanding of this verse, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will hear. And the, uh, the Gemara talks about the uh, Amapaziza, this, uh, uh, this hasty people who rushed into saying that they will do it even before they heard what it is that they're supposed to do. Whatever God said, we will do it. And, you know, okay, and now let's, uh, let's hear what it is that we have agreed uh, to do. So Shadal writes here, Naase mitzvotase. Venishma mitzvot lota ase, she'en bahem asiya, ela lishmoa bekol Hashem. He says, What's the difference between ase and venishma? There are two kinds of mitzvot. There are mitzvot that require doing, and there are mitzvot that require refraining from doing. Mitzvot ase and mitzvot lota ase. And what the people said was, whatever instructions we got from God, we will follow. If it involves doing something, we will do it. If it involves refu refusing to, uh, 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 not doing something, refraining from doing something, then nishma, we will refrain. And that would lead to the translation there at the bottom, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will obey. That, 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 uh, and so, Shadal, of course, knew very well. As I said, he'd gone through Shas twice before he was 18 years old, and he continued to learn Gemara, and, and, and he knew how, how central this idea of Nasev and Ishma was in Jewish tradition. But when it came to writing a Torah commentary, he didn't really think that that is what the phrase meant. And uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, Bible professors here in Israel uh, Professor Uriel Simon, whom I uh, like to quote in an article that he once wrote about Pshat and Rash, he said that, um, he, he said that there's no question that Shadal is offering the Pshat, the correct Pshat explanation of this uh, verse. He said, but if you're a teacher in a Jewish school, don't teach Shadal uh, on this verse, that Naasev and Ishma has become such an important Jewish concept. So if you're teaching a chat, or if you're teaching uh, at, at uh, uh, Charles E. Smith, or where, wherever somebody is, uh, is teaching, teach them that Naasev and Ishma means what the Gemara says that it means. When you get more advanced uh, students like we have here at the Torah in Motion uh, events, then you can tell them that actually the pshat of this phrase is 
we will do what requires doing, and we will refrain from doing what uh, requires refraining from doing. Uh, Okay, maybe I'll just try quickly to give you one last uh, point of Shadal again from this week's Parsha. Uh, both last week and this week, the words pru or avu appear, be, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and it is listed in all the listings of mitzvot as, one, as a mitzvah. Shadal writes in his commentary here, Berachahi, this is incidentally, I wrote here, Mahadurat Basi, there's a new version of, uh, of Shadal uh, based on uh, based on more manuscripts from the students of what he taught, and this uh, the, the latest uh, 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 edition of Shadal was put together by Yonatan Basi, who lives here in Jerusalem. Shadal, in the according to Madurat Basi, says Berachahi kedivreha rava v'chein lamata benoach. As Ibn Ezra wrote, this is a blessing and not a commandment, both in Genesis one and in Genesis nine. That when God says pru or avu, he's giving a blessing to people. It shouldn't be understood as a mitzvah. I'm going to, to save time, I'm just going to read this in English. Anybody wants to go follow the Hebrew. Notice that the rabbis did not consider being fruitful and multiplying as one of the Noahide commandments. It's not one of the Sheva mitzvot the name Noah. Even though God said to Noah, pru or avu, that's not one of the Sheva mitzvot the name Noah. So obviously, it's not a mitzvah. So whether we like it or not, we have to admit that even Ezra is correct, that the rabbis attached the mitzvah of procreating to this verse simply as an asmachta, a mnemonic device. That's not what the verse actually means, but the rabbis said that, uh, that, that uh, as an asmachta, it's a mnemonic device to remember that, it's, uh, that, that there's a mitzvah to have children. They attached it to these words here, even though the pshat of these words is a blessing as opposed to an obligation. He goes on, and now, you hear, you hear the religious Jew, you, you hear him say, I was told that even though Shadal taught all of his life in a rabbinical seminary, in an orthodox rabbinical seminary, he never got smicha. My, uh, my, old, uh, my old friend, uh, Professor Elliot Horowitz, Zichron Oli Bracha, who was an expert in the, uh, uh, in, in the Jews of Italy, heard me one time making reference to Rabbi uh, Samuel David Lutzato, and he politely corrected me afterwards, and he said, Shadal never got smicha. But still, he sounds like a rabbi often, and including here. Even if it is not an explicit mitzvah, we know that it's God's desire that the species should continue. The prophets didn't have to speak of this, since in their days, everybody wanted to have many children. Nevertheless, the classical rabbis wisely chose to count procreation as one of the mitzvot, for certainly it is God's will that humans procreate. The rabbis were smart to say that there's a mitzvah. Actually, the Torah didn't have to tell people to have children because everybody wanted to have children back then. So it wasn't necessary, but the rabbis were wise to tell people that, that, it, that it was a mitzvah. Particularly when our nation shrank in size after the destruction of the second temple, the rabbis had to strengthen this mitzvah. We know that the size of the Jewish people shrank considerably uh, between the first century BCE and the second century CE. So the rabbis had to strengthen this mitzvah. Blessed be he who chose them, the classical rabbis and their teachings. Were it not for their prohibitions and decrees, our nation would have disappeared off the face of the earth as so many large and powerful nations disappeared. We have to give credit to Chazal. They knew what they were doing. And when they said that there's a mitzvah to, uh, to have children, they were, they, they were, uh, considering what the needs of the Jewish people were, and we are very grateful for them for teaching this, even if this isn't the pshat of the verse that says, pru or avu. Okay, we will continue with Shadal next week, but uh, Rabbi Kelman, do you want to- uh, uh, Sure, you uh, want me to read you the-, the, the Sure, the, go the, ahead, yes, why don't you that choose- That was great, by the way, I really enjoyed that, the, excellent. Thank okay, you. Uh, first major question, first real question. What influence, if any, did Ramchal have on Shadal? So it's the same family. If I if I remember correctly, Shadal was um, Chal's great nephew. Uh, I don't know that he had influence. It was a pretty big family, the Lutzato family. Um, 
And it's true that Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, was the, probably the most famous member of the family. But Shadal is making a comeback these days uh, also. Okay, somebody just pointed out the life expectancy at birth in the mid 19th century is only 40 for males. Although I, I'll just comment that's true maybe from year zero, but once you made it past year five, I think the life expectancy went up a lot. In other words, so many people died in infancy, but just comment, I guess that that's a comment that in perspective, living to be 65, uh, you know, was not uh, a young, we have a different expectation nowadays. Okay. Right. Somebody wanted to, to correct you, the yud kei vav kei, but I assume you're relying that there's no problem to say the yud and the hey, whatever, that's uh, fine if you want to. It doesn't bother me. I think it's me. okay to say yud hey. Yeah, I, I totally hear. Just like Hashem, doesn't you? Right. Okay. It's true. That is the standard practice, but that, that that's okay. We, we Okay. Uh, the Noah story, Noah story is really hard to understand as written. Ellen, I don't know if you want to... Uh, Elaborate on that. You mean, I don't know if you mean the back and forth of Elohim and Hashem or just in general. It's true. The months go back and forth. Rashi, you know, has a hard time. Ten months, seven months. The story is Mibul Bal, if you can, uh, if I can use that word on the Mabul, you know. Yes, I totally agree. It's one of the hardest texts to, uh, to, to understand, but uh, I'm still not attracted to the way that the, uh, the, the critics use scissors and paste to construct uh, two different stories and say that, uh, yes. But I, I agree, it, it is a great challenge coming up with an interpretation. You look through, the, anybody who's studying the Parsha this week and looking at Ramban and looking at Rashi, you know, you'll see uh, the, the, difficulties, uh, the difficulties that they have. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah. You're, I assume Yaakov Beasley is you, one of your students who you were referring to. No, uh, I put him in the col colleague uh, category. Oh, colleague, Rabbi Beasley, student and colleague, a, a Tamil Chaver, Rav Yaakov. Okay, so he just want mentioning Josh Berman's uh, article or his recent book. Um, I if the, disproving Which the happens hypothesis. to be on my desk here. Right. Okay. Um, just I wrote a the, review of it in the Jerusalem Post. Uh, so that he he also uses the Noah story to disprove the uh, documentary hypotheses. Very okay. good, thank you, Rabbi for uh, Rabbi Beasley for pointing that out. That's uh, yes. okay. Very uh, true. Uh, Gershon did Wellhausen suggest that Tur was a hybrid Hebrew, not a sing. Okay, uh, yeah, Wellhausen had a JPD different theories, I assume. Reich yes. Nichoach, wordplay for Modai Friggins. By the way, I love the Yomshim from Paul Hirsch's, you know, shot on Reich Nichoach, if I remember correctly. Please, I don't remember. Beautiful. If I, that smell is anticipation. You walk into a room on Friday afternoon in the house, you know what's going to be in the future. You know, feel I got to be there. So smell what's going to be. When a person brings a, a, a korban, there's an anticipation that he's going to improve, going to come closer to God. It's along those lines. I haven't seen it for a while, but I think that's how Hirsch explains Reich Nichoach, which I thought when I first read it, it was a very beautiful... Uh, at least where I come from. Okay, Varum, okay, like a Lamborghini. I, I've never been in one of those, but uh, okay, Varum. <laughs> but I, I get it, the room, the noise, the Varum. Okay. <laughs> I never thought of that. It's cute, okay, very cute. Um, why this, was there no Sofit in Paleo Hebrew? Ktavi Vrit, I have no idea. There yeah. was no Sofit in Paleo Hebrew. And in okay. fact, even once they moved over to Ktav Ashuri, there wasn't uh, there wasn't immediately Otiot Sofiot, and there's a line in the Gemara that says, Mansepach Sofim Amarum, the Mem Nun Tzadi Pei Kaf, the fact that they should be written at a different, in a different way when they're the last letter in a word, that Sofim, the prophets, the leaders, that the, the, this was a later development in Hebrew, having Otiot Sofiot, having different forms for Mem Nun Tzadi Pei and Kaf. So, okay, Kara yeah, very. Uh, Carol has a fascinating comment, I think, that if Puravu was sort of, quote unquote, invented by the rabbis, um, so it's very interesting, they only put it on men and not on women. You know, if you learn Vichib Shuha, you know how the Gemara says that it's fascinating that the mitzvah, it's a machloket, of course, in the Gemara, but we assume it's only a mitzvah for men, not for women. I don't know, just, okay. But, and then I assume Morris is referring to Monday's class by, by Rabbi Jweck, uh, who claimed that the Ramcha was a Sephardi, even though he's from Italy, but he's really uh -huh. Sephardic. So he wants to know if Shadal is also Sephardic. Um, so uh, I assume not. I assume you would consider him an Ashkenazi. 
I think that he thought of himself as an Ashkenazi, but I also think that the community in Italy had a mixture of Ashkenazim and Sfaradim that uh, sometimes made it difficult to determine who was an Ashkenazi and a Sfaradi. As Baruch Hashem is the situation here in, in uh, Medina Yisrael these days, that there, there is uh, a lot of uh, marriage between uh, Ashkenazim and Sfaradim. In the early days of the state, it wasn't that common. And today, it's Baruch Hashem, it's very common. And there are a lot of people who just don't know whether they should consider themselves Ashkenazim or Sfaradim. Better that way, like you say. Better course, that now, way, for Italian, sure. Italian Jewry is really, it's, if you've been to Italy, you know, it's not, it's its own nuschat. It's, it developed totally differently. Italian Jewry, that if you please go out one day, we can go back on our tour and motion trips. We'll go back to Italy and uh -huh. uh, see that. Okay, another interesting comment. I think I just saw, hold on. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Lisa just pointed out what I think the Mesha Chachma says it's not a mitzvah for me because they would die in childbirth, right? That's how the Mesha Chachma explains it. The, right. Rachinoam, the Torah didn't want to insist that women put through pain and suffering, but if they wanted to, they could. I'll tell you Mark Shapiro's line, by the way, I'm, I'm proof of where he, I guess, imagine he's slightly disagreeing or, or maybe not. He didn't comment on the rabbi, the right? He just said that um, Chaza, we had to make it a mitzvah proof because if not, there would have been pious Jews who would have said, kids like Ben Az, how can I have kids? You know, in other words, it, it's dirty. It's it's the sexual act. It's it's not appropriate for a Ben Torah. So in order that the Hasidim should have mitzvah, I, that was a brilliant insight, Mark said it on actually our, our trips, why the Torah had to have Purubu, so nobody could give you that argument. Anyways, that's, uh, okay, lots. How did Mordechai Breuer, Ruth wants to know, feel on Shadal? Okay. How do people I feel on, on Mordechai Breuer? When we get to 20 and 21st, so Dr. Lection, please God, will give a talk on Mordechai Breuer. <laughs> not there yet, but uh, we'll get not there, there yet. Day. And, but, uh, and I don't really know how he what he thought about Shadal, but uh, I'd be interested to try to find out. There, are, there are many of uh, or, or, of Mordechai Breuer's uh, students who are friends and neighbors of mine here in Jerusalem, and I can ask them uh, yeah. uh, that question. Yeah, but he asked uh, fascinating, and also the same question: Was he really Orthodox? And people ask, of course, the same thing on. Uh, Right, of course, Orthodox is a made-up term. We, where you know, Orthodoxy was whatever. That's a whole other discussion. But okay, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. Really fascinating. We look forward to next week, part two. Tonight, we're starting. A, I think also a fascinating series on the Haftarah of the week. Usually, you get lots of shir on the partial week, which is it's the more night shir. But tonight, Dr. Moshe Sokolov will be giving a beginning a weekly series on the Haftarah of the week. So that's 8.30 this evening. We'll send out an email in a little bit and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Shuli Miskin from Archaeology in the Ancient Land, the four part series, uh, giving you tours, uh, online virtual archaeology tours from Israel 11 in the morning and tomorrow night, the the, the Parsha Shear. And we look forward to learning with everybody, seeing you and uh, everybody be well, be safe. And yes, Dr. Lakshman, what would you like I to say? I just wanted to say, I see that there are some faces from Israel here. And I would like to point out to the faces from Israel, if you put this into your calendar, next week, this class Excellent. will be at 5 p.m. Right. Israel time and not at 6 p.m. because right. we're right. changing our clocks here. And I assume that we're- A week uh, later, just for one week. Yes, just for one week we'll be off. So you you can rest assured, Rabbi Kelman, I I, I know that, <laughs> that right. I have to show well, up. I five, mentioned but... it yesterday after our Tehillim class with Benny Gesundheit. I did mention it, but yes, we will point that out because I'm sure there will be somebody who's going to miss the class because not right. everybody reads the. I tell people all the time, read the emails. You know, people yeah. they don't always read emails. You know, I I get it, I get it. So uh, next right. week, 11 a.m. Eastern. 5 p.m. I don't know, what do, you, what do you call it? Israel time. I guess you call it Israel time. Israel time. Israel time. IST, Israel Standard Time. Israel yeah. Standard Time. Okay, we change uh, the next Saturday night. Yeah, November yes. 1st. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, very good. And then you have lots of people thanking you for a great lecture at the bottom. But uh, okay. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Uh, nice to see everybody. We look forward to those who can make it to see you later on this evening and tomorrow a couple of times and have a wonderful day. And uh, same time, same tour in motion, Zoom, Zoom channel. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Wonderful seeing you all. Thank you for coming.